Thank you very much, Michelle, for your kind introduction. Good morning, dear friends. Again, I have the task of ta talking about very unpleasant things. I'm very honored that Bishop Pat, as I hear you are called, uh, he, that you are here again. And I thank you very much, Father Bochanski, for your talk. Uh, what, I'm talk the, what is happening uh, to our children in school and in the whole of society is doing everything to the children that they cannot follow this path. What you said is, what Jesus says, the truth will set you free. Uh, and we need self-mastery. We all have desires, affections. They pull us in every direction, but we have a free will. We have to use that free will, and we have to learn to use our free will, which is not easy. And uh, this is the path this, we should be taught. This is what we should learn in families, what we should learn in school, apart from the passing on the values of our culture and the skills of our culture. It's, fam it's character formation, and the opposite is happening in our schools. And I think it is the most dangerous attack of this cultural sexual revolution which is happening. Every revolution grabs the children. Yeah? Every revolutionary movement, be it the Nazis, be it the communists, uh, whatever it is, they go after the next generation because, of course, they know once they have got the ne next generation, they believe they are on safe grounds and now the world will be uh, as they imagine it. It always breaks down because it is not in accordance with human nature. Uh, so it doesn't really have a, f a future, uh, but it is very, very dangerous if our children are molded in a way uh, that their, their inner powers and possibilities of becoming themselves are destroyed. So this is what I'm going to talk about. It is in my book the longest chapter. Uh, I myself, as you heard, I don't know what it said, I have three children. Uh, and as a mother, this is where our heart is the most strongest uh, affection we have, we want a future for our children. Yeah, so this is uh, my motivation. I want a future, my children are now in the middle of their 30s, but my first grandchild is on the way, I'm delighted to say. And we want a future, not only for our children, but for all children. And this is why I'm going to tell you, and I think we have to open our eyes to what is happening, and at the end, when you hear all this, uh, I pray for the Holy Spirit, and I pray now, Holy Spirit, shine your light into everybody's heart of each person sitting here, and show each person what the next step is and what you want us to do and the time we live in. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you remember a time when one spoke of innocent children? These two words are bonded together. We thought of children as innocent because they were not yet involved in sex. Sexuality, a gift from God, a beautiful gift from God, is destined for, destined for love and procreation and it can so easily lead to the loss of innocence because ever since Adam and Eve were driven out of paradise, we are flawed human beings. We have lost the presence of God. We are split between spirit and body. They might pull us in different directions and we have a fundamental conflict between man and woman. God said to Eve, your desire shall be contrary to your husband's to your husband, but he shall rule over you. It is our life task to overcome these fundamental divisions in our existence. Religion and the social and legal norms of society used to support people in this. Virtue was still something desirable. Now the word has disappeared. And children in school were taught to strive for, virtu for virtue. And in families, of course. 
by protecting them from sexual talk and sexual images, their childhood was protected. Of course, children are curious and examine the human body, but the sexual drive controlled by hormones is, uh, is not yet active in them. Only when puberty sets in, the sex hormones zoom up. I'm sure in this beautiful country, to say the truth, I haven't seen much of the beauty because it's raining all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Still, the majority of families holds on to this and make sure, makes sure that the children can play, explore nature, and learn without their minds set on sexuality. But Family Planning New Zealand, a part of a branch of International Planned Parenthood active over the whole earth with billions and billions of money, Family Planning New Zealand pushes successfully for occupying the minds of children with sexual matters from preschool pre onwards through all age grades. They were funded here, your organization with $11 million in 2015 by the government. $11 million. What could we do if we had that much money, yeah? Family Planning New Zealand is a branch, as I just said, of International Planned Parenthood, who are the largest abortion providers of this world. They do both. They sexualize children, they create their own customers for abortion. And they use abortion, as you will probably have heard, to sell body parts of aborted babies. Under the pressure of this global agenda, it is becoming more and more difficult for parents around the world to guard the innocence of their children. Media are aggressively pushing their sexualized messages and even pornography into everybody's brain and heart. In the age of smartphones, children cannot be protected from por pornography and the schools are not easily protected. John Henry told us some ways how to do this, how actually to control it, yeah? And the schools force hedonistic concepts of sexuality into children from kindergarten onwards. This is happening in New Zealand, just as, this is, just as it is in Germany and all other Western cultures. Wherever there's resistance, the strongest resistance is in Africa, these nations are put under pressure to adopt so-called reproductive health services, which is a code word of the United Nations and the international organizations for comprehensive sexuality education and abortion. The sexualization of children by force of state is the most serious assault of the sexual revolution because it changes the human being. Children are like clay. They are molded by the influences around them and thus formed for the rest of their lives. Jesus always has possibilities to enter that and change people, yeah, but from the human perspective. Sexualization of children destroys the family and it destroys the dream of love which all children have for their own life. Let us look at it in detail. The cultural significance of sexual norms. Family is built upon the monogamous marriage of one man and one woman who give birth to children and create an environment in which they can grow up to be loving, healthy, achieving individuals who themselves will build families and have their own children. Family cannot exist without monogamy between the spouses and a space free of sexuality in which children can grow up. To build a family on the necessary virtue of chastity requires the human being to be educated through religion, tradition, example, and the written and unwritten written social norms of a society. The person must learn to renounce immediate satisfaction of desire in order to achieve something greater. What did you say? Say no for the bigger yes. Yeah? The greater aim is the realization of love in marriage and family. When in the course of this talk, you hear things which at first sight you experience, maybe not you, but most of the world would do so, as old-fashioned and intolerant, just go back 
to the time when you were a child? Wasn't your deepest wish that you, that you were conceived in love? And that your parents were united in a loving relationship for all their life? Is there one single child who does not want that? And if that broke up, or your own marriage broke up, think of the suffering and the scars that that caused in your life. To realize the dream of love is not easy, but it is possible. Many in this hall here can give witness for it. Sex is far more than a personal issue of individual happiness. It is crucial for the whole of society. As sex goes, so goes the family. As the family goes, so goes society. A scientific study opened my eyes and made me focus on the issue of sexuality in my work soon after my conversion in 1997. An Oxford scholar, his name is J.D. Unwin, did ethnological research on the issue of sex and culture. That's the title of his work. 650 pages, published by Oxford University Press in 1934. His result was high cultures depend on monogamy. If that is given up, a culture, quote, steps down from the stage of history. He found no exception to that rule. I looked around, and what do I see? Hypersexualization, legalization of abortion, demographic crisis, mass migration in Europe. Is there any connection between these things? I think there is. There were a few individuals whose impact on sexualization of children was decisive. Uh, my, first ch my second chapter in my book, I'm tracing this beginning with the French Revolution, all these big minds still revered, most of them to the present day, Margaret Sanger, for instance, one of them, who all contributed to what we have now. It doesn't just fall down or come up from hell in one moment. Uh, it is a long process, yeah? I just mentioned two people, Wilhelm Reich, Austrian, worked in German, a pupil of Sigmund Freud, a communist, they are all communists, these, these people who have contributed to it. M many of them were members of the Communist Party. Party. He was a sexual revolutionist in the pre-war Germany, author of the book, The Sexual Revolution. He looked for new methods of bringing down the bourgeois society. And he knew, and puts, uh, explains it in his book, if you sexualize children, that will do the job. Quote, we do not discuss the existence or non-existence of God. We merely eliminate the sexual repressions and dissolve the infantile ties to the parents by sexualization." End of quote. Yeah, he knew what he was doing, and I believe all the organizations who are pressuring this program into our societies now know what they are doing, just we are asleep. The influence, the second person, of Alfred Kinsey cannot be overestimated. To the present day, he's respectfully considered as the father of sexology. He was a sadomasochistic porn addict and prided himself to own the largest collection of pornography. In his Kinsey report, which was very influential in the last century, there is, uh, he pretends it's all science, yeah? It's, and gives tables and statistics. There's this famous table 34. And there, the, it contains statistics of how many orgasms baby can have in what time. For that, babies had to be tortured with sexual abuse. This is the basis for the idea which is pervading the comprehensive sexual education of our time that the child has a desire and a right for sexual satisfaction. 
Building on Alfred Kinsey, Western culture has chosen to sexualize children from the very beginning of their lives and introduce them to deviant sexual identities and practices with ever increasing radicalness. Behind this is a hedonistic concept of sexuality. What is hedonism? It is a school of thought that argues that pleasure is the most important good of human life. A hedonist strives to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Hed hedonism in sexuality means do everything that maximizes your lust at any age and with any person you feel attracted to, man, woman, or both. Or even, it even goes beyond that. Why should there be any limits to the way we have sex? Why not have it with animals? What's, why not, yeah? Uh, and of course, have it with children, we are, our culture is on that path, even if it pretends uh, to, to put a bar to that. Um, all sexual activities are of equal value. Heterosexuality, gay, lesbian, bi, and transsexuality. Change your gender if that feels good to you. According to the 2010 report of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, the goal of sexual education should be, quote, pleasure in and enjoyment of sexuality, abolishing guilt feelings about eroticism. United Nations program for sexuality, what we have to teach our children. But sexuality has a very different meaning. It is designed to unite a man and a woman, as we beautifully heard in the previous talk, and give life to a new human being. How great is that? Yeah, what great calling we have. The enjoyment is in service of these two existential functions. It is not an aim in itself. Only one limitation for sexual activity is still left, the principle of consent. Only do what your sexual partner agrees to. But how can that principle work if the sexual drive is out of control? And it does not work, as we see uh, with pr uh, global pornography addiction and pervasive sexual abuse. The church is the is not the only place where this happens. In fact, it is the place where it happens least. It does happen, which is terrible, mm -hmm. but it happens all over in our neighborhood, maybe in our families, everywhere. Woe to anybody who objects to this hedonistic idea, who points to the risks, to the lost dreams, to the severe consequences of this concept. Get rid of him. He's intolerant, homophobic, big by bigot discriminating, he or she. The hedonistic approach to sexuality, devoid of any moral standards, is promoted and forced into school curricula by the United Nations and its sub-agencies, World Health Organization, UNICEF, UNICEF, all these beautiful postcards for children at Christmas, United Nations Population Fund by the European Union, and its web of sub-organizations by global NGOs like IPPF, as you heard, the greatest abortion undertaker, by national governments, above all the United States of America, and your own government and my own government. Here the organizations are Family Planning New Zealand, the New Zealand Sexual Health Society, the abortion provider, I can't pronounce it, Aotearoa, Okay, um, in Australia, it's Safe School Coalition. Their propaganda intends to delude the minds of people. Yes, we want to responsibly plan the size of our family. Yes, we want to be healthy. Yes, we want to have safe schools for our children. We want schools where our children are not exposed to pornography and sexual harassment, even sexual abuse. But the organizations who pretend to answer these basic needs and demands of parents, in reality, do the opposite. 
They immerse children in pornographic sex education. They do nothing to protect them from pornography. They risk their health by driving children into early sexual activity. They undermine the rights of parents to educate their own children. And this truly is a human right, which is put down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and, for instance, in our Constitution. What <laughs> what do we expect children to do when they are asked to talk about their genitals in class or in kindergarten, when they are asked to pull condoms of a plastic penises and discern the different tastes of condoms, when they are constantly immersed in sexual issues and exposed to pornography from, from a very early age onwards? Children do what they see because that is how they learn, by copying what they see grown-ups do, first in play. Play is real life for children. Children in kindergartens are provided with corners for sex play. The instruction they get is don't do anything the other child doesn't want, and don't put objects into your body because it could hurt you. Otherwise, everything is fine, and go into your private corners. I must say, this is not happening in every kindergarten, it is not happening in every school, but it is, hap it is pr the program, just if you read what IPBF is putting forward or all these other organizations, they are all for that. Sexual plays are really no play at all. They lead to sexual abuse of children by children. They rob children of their childhood. They rob their innocence, the lightness and joy of the life of a child. Let us have a look at the content of sexuality education as put forward in official documents of the World Health Organization, EPPF, UNICEF, and many others. What I'm describing, yeah, uh, it's not happening everywhere, but it is the program. So in preschool age, this is from a document by the World Health Organization Standards for Sexuality Education in Europe. It's worked out by the World Health Organization together with the German insti state insti institution. Encourage masturbation from babyhood onwards. Show them how to do it. Information about different types of sexual or orientation in preschool age and different types of family, like single family, patchwork family, rainbow family, and yes, there is some traditional old-fashioned family also, yeah? Children's books where the prince marries the prince. Private corners for masturbation and sex play in kindergartens. So then they come to school. Children are trained to be contraception experts, selling them the lie of safe sex. The very concrete risks of STDDs, sexual transmitted diseases, which are exploding, not despite, but because of this kind of sexualization, are rarely mentioned. Abortion is presented, it's up to you, make a quick decision, we will hide it from your parents, here's the address where you can do it. Children are introduced to LGBT lifestyles from the first to the last grade in all schools, in all subjects. In Germany, we have a federal system of education, and the gay lobby is asked by the state to develop the curricula and actually carry them out, yeah? Uh, and they're paid for it, of course. And then they go into the schools and tell pu pubescent uh, boys how wonderful it is to be gay. This is done by graphic material, videos, forced verbalization of sexual activities, graded tests, Role plays of sexual activities. Anal and oral sex is presented as normal with the sad consequence that cancer in the mouth is increasingly diagnosed with young people. Activists of IPPF and LGBT organizations have access to classrooms in the absence of the teacher. Homosexual couples and transgender persons enter the classroom and help youth in puberty to come out. Even programs of prevention of sexual abuse, which we all want, work with the paradigm that children need to know their bodies as instruments of sexual satisfaction 
in order to ward off sexual transgressions. That's the theory. Yeah, so it's again used. In reality, this prepares the emotionally needy child for the acceptance of sexual advances because it cannot distinguish tenderness from sexual approaches. An intact sense of shame is the condition